we're going to do things a little bit differently today. Um, and Steve, if you want, you can click, click the lights on. If you would grab your Bibles and go to First Kings 17. I want to just uh, kind of do, uh, if you don't mind, two messages today. One's kind of a mini and one's more, more the, the maximum one or the, the main emotional one. And depending on where you're at, you get to pick which one's the mini. Um, but one of the things that I'm painfully aware of when we go through series like what we're going through right now, again, with this time of, uh, of rise and talking about um, issues that are pretty hot, pretty big hot buttons in our lives, and some of us are really struggling in some of the areas. These last two weeks and today as we get into money, we're talking about some of the more emotional ones, some of the ones that can really challenge us and put us into struggle. And I just want to make sure that as we're going through this and we're looking at it very boldly and we're looking at it over and over again and we're calling ourselves to get out of places of being uh, complacent, out of places of muck and mire and rising up to the areas that God's calling us to in freedom, that we don't leave behind anybody who's struggling. That we don't leave behind anybody who is like, I know I've got to do better, I know that I've got to be faithful and then I messed up again, or I, I screwed up again, or I fell on my face again. And when we do that, sometimes we feel guilty. Sometimes we feel like God's disappointed in us. Sometimes we feel like God might even be mad at us. And I, I just want to address that, because we don't leave anybody behind us. We just kind of plow through. And this series really is a plow through big series. So I just want to take a few moments and kind of remind ourselves about the heart of God and how much he loves you as his child and how caring he is about your situation. And so I just want to share with you just quickly this story that's in First Kings. Uh, it's going to start in 17, it goes through 20, but it's a story in the life of Elijah. And if you're not familiar with Elijah, he was a prophet in the, 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 these particular days. That means God spoke to him, and then he had to give the word to God's people. Uh, usually being a prophet was not a popular thing. It was usually speaking the truth, or he might be speaking a judgment from God on the people. And they, they, it, he, not, again, not always a popular thing which is the case in Elijah's case scenario. The story starts out with God coming to Elijah and saying, my people are not being faithful. My people are not being faithful. And they have another God in their lives, that through their king Ahab, and through the influence of his wife Jezebel, that they have brought in Baal worship, this worship of this other God into their community. And God passed a judgment on them, trying to get their attention, trying to draw them back close into him by, uh, hey, by taking and bringing a drought. So he sent Elijah to go and tell the king there's going to be a drought for many years. And then God said, Elijah, the king's not happy with you. He doesn't like you. Nobody likes you now. So I'm going to move you over here into the valley. And I'm going to put my hand of protection over you. And I'm going to feed you by ravens because we've got a drought going on. There's not a lot of food. I'm going to take and uh, give you drink with a spring that runs through there, that continued to run through there even though there was a drought. And he took care of Elijah and protected over Elijah for three years Why Ahab, the king, was going nuts. And he was killing prophets. He was looking for Elijah. He wanted Elijah dead. After the three years came to be, I'm just kind of summarizing the first part, because the first part's all about victory and confidence. After the end of the three years, God said, I want you to go to Ahab and tell him that rain's about to come. And if it was me, I think I'd have some reservations about going and talking to the king that's been trying to find me and kill me for the last three years, Right? You know, we, if we have reasons to stress about money and about our marriages and everything, this guy had a reason to stress out. But he went confidently to the king, and he said, God wants there to be a showdown between your God and mine, and you're going to set up two altars up on the mountain, and we're going to put animals on, and we're going to have this showdown between me and 450 prophets of your false god, and he's going to reveal who's God and who's not. And he wants all the people of Israel, so what, five, six million people, to come and watch this. So now he's been put into a stage where something miraculous has to happen. What they're betting on is which God would send fire from heaven to eat up what's on their particular altar. So he's waiting for the miraculous in front of 450 other prophets, in front of a king who wants him dead, and 5 million people so that God doesn't show up. He looks like an idiot and is going to die. You with me? And sure enough, what happens? Baal doesn't show up. God shows up. Elijah is, is in a great strong place all of a sudden. God is, is, is a, there's a reminder of how faithful God is to all the people. They put the 400 prophets, uh, 450 prophets of Baal to death. And then Elijah says, we're not done yet because God said there's going to be rain. And he said, I want to, my servant to go over and look over the cliff. You tell me if you see clouds. So when went over and came back. He's like, no, I don't see anything. He's like, not good enough. It's going to rain. You go back and look and see if there's any clouds. 
comes back. Nope, nothing. Seven times he makes the servant go until the servant says, you know what, there is a cloud about the size of my fist coming up out of the sea. And he says, that's it, king, you better get home because you're about to get wet. Okay, this is just a very confident man, not a cocky man in the Lord, but a confident man in the Lord, knowing that God's going to come through. And that's, I wish, is the confidence that I brought to the table every single time. However, we look in 1 Kings 19, I just want to share this with you. We're going to see that things change drastically in a matter of a day. At the beginning of 19, Ahab, the king, kind of pouty, kind of upset, goes home and he says to his wife what happens. And Jezebel takes and sends a message to Elijah, and this is verse 2. It says, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them, like one of the prophets of Baal. Okay, so no, she goes, I want to kill you. Now this old half of Elijah, everybody wanted to kill him. The king wanted to kill him. Fifty people wanted to kill him, right? This is nothing. Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. All of a sudden there's this immediate switch over. Something about this situation made him freak out and fall down as far as his confidence. And it says that he went out into the desert and he, he took him in a certain way and he said to his assistant, I'll tell you what, you stay here. I need to go by myself. He went further out into the desert. He fell down at a tree and he said, God, take my life. I am done. A complete reversal. Complete reversal. Why he was scared of Jezebel and not Ahab and not the other people, I have no idea, but this is a complete reversal. Catch up with me here in verse 5, because I think at this point we're wondering, okay, what's God think about this? Is God upset? Is God ticked? Verse 5, about halfway through, through, it says, All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank, and he lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is just too much for you. So he got up and he ate and he drank, and strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Then he went into a cave and spent the night. Understand what's going on here. According to the scripture, there are two roles that angels play, worshiping God and being ministering agents for God to his people, to those that he created in his image. So God, this is some angel that went rogue. God said, I want you to go take care of this man. And he went down and says there was hot coals and they made bread. It wasn't just he showed up with, you know, thing of whatever bread. Who, who makes bread? Okay, yes. Yeah, I can't think of anybody. Well, who? Nichols. nichols. Love nichols. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Billy eat bread. But he showed up and it says that over hot coals, and if any of you guys ever made a charcoal grill fire, you know what I'm talking about. This is not quick. This is not easy. He builds this up, and he takes and breaks the bread. He gives him the bread. He gives him the drink. And instead of saying, you're a jerk, you're an idiot, I can't believe you felt again, he said, the journey's too much. We get it. We understand that you're overwhelmed right now, and I just want to love on you a little bit. And he let him sleep, and he woke him up a second time and said, you know what, you need more. Here's some more food. Here's some more drink. Here's, you get, get some more rest. And at that point, he was able to continue his journey to get to the mountain of God to be able to see God himself. And according to this, he went up and he got into the cave and he was waiting on God. God said, Elijah, what are you doing here? He's like, I'll tell you the whole story. And God says, I'll tell you what, you wait up by the front of the cave and you wait till I come by. I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you. And I'm thinking, ooh, he's going to get spanked, right? You know, just like, <laughs> what's going on when God shows up face to face to him? And it says that when he got up there, that all of a sudden there was this massive earthquake that just rocked the entire mountain. Okay, so you're, you're sitting there thinking about this. You're at the front of the cave. You're waiting for God to show up. An earthquake, that's coincidental timing, right? You're just like, okay, God doesn't seem to be very happy. But according to this, God was not in the earthquake, so he did not go outside. You with me? Almost immediately after, this became this huge wind that rocked the entire mountain. Okay, coincidence gone. Something special is going on here. Boulders are falling. There's avalanches, everything all around going on. And it says he did not go out of the cave because God was not in the wind. And then it said there became this huge mass of fire just engulfed the entire mountain, took out all the vegetation, all the trees, all the plant life. And he didn't go outside because God wasn't in it. That's the way I would expect him to show up, especially when I'm feeling guilty. But according to this, if we go to verse 13, uh, verse 12, halfway through, it says, After the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, and he went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Because God was in the gentle whisper. You got that? Just make sure none of us miss it. That voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And so Elijah tells him the whole situation again. They want to kill me. I'm just overwhelmed. 
Verse 15, the Lord says to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel king of Aram. Also anoint Jehu son of Nishi king of Israel. And anoint Elijah son of Sophat uh, from Abel Melua. I'm, I'm just going to admit I'm pronouncing all this wrong. To secede you as a prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazel. And Elijah will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. Don't miss what God said here. He says, I got it. Now it's time to go back. Now it's time to pick up where we left off. I understand there's overwhelmed. I understand we fell. I understand you're overwhelmed. I met you here. I provided for you need. But now it's time to go back. And not only will you go back and try again, but I'm going to send people who are going to help you. I'm going to alter the plan so that there's others that are involved too, so this is not all on you. And I just want to make sure that while we're going through these things, whether it be being a Christian single, being a Christian husband, being a Christian wife, being a Christian parent, being a Christian who's being parented, or whether we're talking about finances, and we try, and we try to do better, and we try to tithe, and we try to communicate, and we try to move forward, and it doesn't seem to be working, and we fall down again, and then we end up getting upset with our kids, and all these different things happen, that what God is doing is he is preparing to help you, love you, and get you back on the path. It's not okay to make your own path. He says, we'll get you back there. But he does want people to help you. He does want other people to love on you. He does want to love on you himself. So look for that provision and look for that heart. But don't be looking for a God who wants to beat you up. As your dad does not want to beat you up, but he doesn't want you to give up either. Does that make sense? And that's why it's so important on the slides that we're put, putting up there, the, the Y series, that this is not the end. This is not the end. This is not the time to fall down in the desert and say, God, kill me. This is the time to let him minister to you, to get other people involved in your life, keep looking at the word, keep doing the word, and moving forward. Are you with me? Your dad loves you so much. Your dad loves you so very much. And it grieves him when we think otherwise. And we're going to be covering a lot of ground today as we talk about finances. There are snippets all throughout the scripture on this topic. Uh, I'm going to reference many of them, but I'm not going to uh, jump us all around the Bible uh, or even put them all up on the screen. If you notice, I gave you an insert this week that has the scriptures that we're covering uh, today so that you can study into it more as far as the things I'm referencing at home. If you want to go even deeper, uh, get a concordance or even just do a Google search and put Bible verses on money and trust me, you'll be good for a week uh, you know, as far as what's in there. So. I'm going to try to encompass a lot of thoughts on money because money is so huge into our period of time together. So I appreciate uh, your patience as we do so. And I'm going to structure it because usually if we structure it, it's a little easier to morsel it by looking at different areas of um, places where we could be financially in our budgets. One is crisis mode, which some of us are in crisis mode and understand crisis mode very well. One is living paycheck to paycheck, which uh, again, many of us understand. And then we're going to kind of talk about some uh, financial stability and some financial freedom as well. But, but before I get into those, because each one's going to have their own set of scriptures, their own set of thoughts and commentary uh, to them, I want to talk about things that apply to all of us, no matter where we're at financially. Sound good? And then that way it will help us a little bit as we go through some of these other things. So we're just going to kind of dig in, and uh, Mal- Malachi is going to kind of be a uh, starting point. And I'm going to have to turn there because as I redid my notes. Uh, I did not add that scripture. Malachi 3, just to kind of get you in the ballpark. Malachi 3 is going to introduce us into talking a little bit about tithing and offering. And this is a topic that different people have different opinions on, depending on how you look at the scripture. And I personally believe that tithing and offering is still very much in place today in the New Testament age in the church. But I'm going to kind of explain both sides of it as you dig into it. Malachi, when we look at the Old Testament, tithing and offering was very cut and dry. Tithing is giving 10% of our first fruits back to God. Everything he gives to us that we are commanded to give back to him for his ministry and as an act of faithfulness showing that money is not more important to me than than you are. And so they would give their 10% back to God. And then offerings is anything over that 10% that God puts on your heart to do. Okay, just for simple definitions. 
And they would be challenged in this area. And this is kind of where Malachi comes in. He's also a prophet, like Elijah. So again, sometimes he says things people aren't all that nuts about. But as they're talking about this issue, there comes this point in Malachi 3, as you look through there, that God says to them, hey, look, you guys have got to stop robbing me. And they say, well, how are we robbing you, guys? He goes, in your tithes and offerings. You are not being faithful in this area. And this is an important area for you to be faithful in. So that's one of the reasons why when I talked two weeks ago, I'm kind of concerned for some of us who are not being financially faithful, who are crying out to God, help me, send me more money, or take down my bill, whatever the case may be, because in essence what we're saying to God is, if this is still in place, which we'll debate in a second, God, I'm ripping you off of what is yours, but I also want you to give me more. And that's a kind of a concerning place for us to be. And so the question becomes, is tithing, is offering still New Testament? Is it still the church? For some, they believe that it's not. And as long as they're consistent with it, I'm actually celebrate their position. Because from their perspective, or even from my perspective, Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. Okay? And there's several things within the law that are no longer applied to us because he fulfilled the law. Other things still do as we all act in obedience to God. So the question is, did he fulfill this part? And if you feel that he did fulfill this part, then it becomes a fullness of love saying that 100% is God's. It's no longer about 10% or 20%, just 100% is God's, period. And as long, as long as we act that way, I celebrate that. That, that, that is true. That's a fulfillment, as long as we are fully giving back to God. My concern is most of the people, and I would say probably all but one, that fanatically, in my just personal experience, not saying that there's not more, usually when someone's debating this with me in a friendly way, it's usually to excuse the fact that they don't give God anything. And they're not trusting him with their finances, and they're spending their money on themselves and their family, and it's complete self-centered. And they're like, well, God can't be mad because God, Jesus fulfilled it. If you're going to be consistent, say 100% is God's, I'm with you. Just be consistent. But if not, don't use it as a defense not to be faithful and try to make it holy. You with me? That's just not acceptable to him. Personally, I believe it is still in place. If we look at Matthew, and you have that scripture on your notes that we gave you, and if you didn't get them, if you came in late, we'll have some extras. But... Um, in Matthew, there's a scene where Jesus is talking to Pharisees and Sadducees. And they are giving the tenth. They are being financially faithful to, to God. But Jesus has a bone to pick with them. And he says, here's my problem that I have with you guys. You guys are giving your tenth, but you're not acting in love towards others. And what you need to do is the latter without negating the former. So to me, this is the whole, this is the whole verse of why I still think this is still today. Jesus had a great opportunity to say, you guys are tithing. You're doing the old law. But the new way... The fulfillment of the law is love. So you guys need to be loving. Forget about the rules. Forget about the regulations. But that's not what he said. He says what you need to do is be loving while still being obedient to me. And he uses this as an example. So to me, it's still very much in place. So everything I'm going to give you today is going to be from that standpoint because you're stuck with Tom commentary. <laughs> so that's how we're going to play it, is that tithing is still very much the case today. And if, the thing that's exciting about it is if we go back to Malachi, which is in front of you, Right after that, God says, you know what? Test me on this. I love this part. This is the only part in the Bible God ever says, test me on this. We know Jesus said, you don't test the Lord your God. God says, dude, seriously, test me on this. Be faithful on this and don't see if I don't open up my floodgates. Don't see if that opens up the flow between you and me that I can take care of your needs. You with me? But it's more than just giving the 10%. It's even more than the promise. It is a joy in giving because we believe in that promise. And we don't do it with just hearts of like, oh, I can't believe i got to do this for God. But coming with joy and coming of our first fruits, and that's huge, the first fruits. And I'll tell you why. There's a few things that that opens up. First off, when we come with our first fruits, which is part of God's command, because if we look at Cain and Abel, what was the problem that Cain had? It wasn't that he wasn't giving his 10% to God. It was, he was not giving the first fruits like Cain or Abel was. And when he got mad at God about it, God said, dude, this is easy as I'll get out. Just give me your first fruits. That's it. It'll be blessed, I'm telling you. I mean, God was excited about this opportunity and came blew it. We have to give our first fruits. We have to give our, of, our, of our, our most, the best that God has given to us. And the thing is within that is that that takes out a statement of our vocabulary. Because, again, we're going to be very blunt. This is, I love you guys enough to be very blunt. If you're giving your first fruits of God, then there is no such statement as I don't have money to tithe. It doesn't exist. I'm giving my first fruit. All of us have our 10% of what God's given us. It's just logical. 
Now, there's very realistic things to say, then I don't have money to buy groceries, or I don't have money to do electric, or I don't have money to do this, or I don't have money to do that. Those are all very valid that we'll get into as we talk about crisis mode. But whether or not we have the money to tithe is not valid. Love you. The compassion part was at the beginning. I hope you were here. <laughs> not so much, right? This is just the truth of it. And a side note is because I've had a lot of people ask this, and some people might be thinking it, uh, and I've talked about this before too. Also from the first fruit standpoint, you really have to struggle biblically and before your God on whether or not that means you tithe from your gross or your take home. A lot of, I know some people struggle with that. For me, it's, it's my gross. I don't pay the government before I pay my God. Uh, I know one of my mentors, I wrote to last week, he was preaching on this one time, and he was talking about the same thing and had the same position, and he was like, just, again, stay consistent. If you believe it's what you take home, then make sure when the income tax comes in, you remember God and that you're faithful there. Uh, personally, I like when my income tax comes in that I can do offering with it because offering is really fun to do. And I'm going to explain that in a little bit. There's a lot of joy in giving offering. But, again, we have to come to those things. What does first fruit mean? What's 10% mean? And what does joy bring? And this is going to affect us in every single category we're going to talk about today. The other one I want to talk to you about is hospitality. Hospitality, taking care of others. And if you look at it truly from a New Testament standpoint, Brent, Brent and I was watching this. We were doing some theology uh, work the other night. And someone presented this, and I was kind of uncomfortable with it, but the more I watch it, the guy's right, that we are truly commanded to take care of one another within the body of Christ. That's huge within the New, New Testament teaching. Also to take care of others, but we're really commanded to take care of one another. Uh, one of the verses that kind of stood out to me is First John 3, 17 through 18. Again, that's in your notes. It says, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. And while you might be in crisis mode, you're thinking, man, how can I take care of somebody else? Here's the only thing I've got for you, and we talked about this before too. When you look at the rich man and Lazarus, the beggar, okay, it says that the beggar, Lazarus, was at the rich man's gate. And I hold on to that scripture to help me understand who I can help and who I don't help because, quite frankly, I can't cover everybody. I just don't have to. But the beggar, Lazarus, was at his gate. God had brought him to him to deal with. He didn't have to go down two gates and deal with the beggars down there. He had to deal with what God had brought to him. And I'm convinced that when God brings someone to you to help, whether it be with your time, whether it be with your finances, whether it be with your material needs, then he's going to provide the things that you need to help them. And it's us to decide whether or not we're going to follow or whether we're going to get defensive and hold everything to ourselves. You know, I mean, like, I might not have any money, but I might have somebody who doesn't have a coat, and I have three of them. There's opportunities there. And I think we truly have to, if we're going to follow the word, get hospitality, taking care of others in our mentality, in our budgets, in our ways of structuring so that we're mindfully helping others as God leads them to us. Does that, that make sense? Because our general humanness is going to say, well, I can't do that. We're called to do that. This has got to be part of our, our structure as well. Is everybody together on that? Okay, everybody breathe. We got through section one. Ah, oh, nice. Okay. So let's slap up a budget up on the screen. Scott, if you'll get us the first one up there. And this is not all-encompassing budgets. They probably don't make sense. This particular person, I'm going to deem them as in a crisis mode. And I know some people sitting in here that will watch past the, the podcast and say, that's not a crisis mode. They've got it easy. I understand. It's not all-encompassing. This person doesn't even have kids. That's nice. They don't have child care. But it's just kind of a working thing for us to start working off of. In this particular budget, we're going to see that there's a lot of different things that they're spending their money on, but the main things that we're going to note is they don't have anything for helping others. They don't have anything as far as being faithful to God. They are spending, what, almost $200 more a month than what they actually get in, and they're now behind in their credit cards, their gas bill, and their phone bill. I consider this a crisis mode. When you don't have the income to cover your outgo, it's crisis mode. And it gets worse and worse and worse. So the first thing that I'm going to suggest for all of us is to look at the budget and understand the basic concept of a budget. Because if you do not have a budget in your household, and it might look different than the way I do it, and that's okay, but if you don't have a budget where you're being mindful of your finances, you're already losing. God calls us to stewardship. God calls us to using wisdom, and that we all have control of our finances instead of our finances having control over us. So I really encourage you to write down a basic budget. And if you do a basic budget, which would thrill me to know, and make sure it's real. Make sure that you maybe track your spending a little bit. Make sure you're honest with it. 
one of the things that I do, and it's open to any of you guys, is sit down and help people with budgets. Not because I'm the catch-all of all things, but whenever we're struggling, first we want to get to the road, and second we want to have people that are a few steps ahead of us to come back and help us. And I'm willing to do that. But I can't tell you how many times I sit down with people on budgets and then start going, now wait a minute, I know you do a lot of paintball, and I don't see that in your spending budget. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that and put that down. Or, I know you're meeting with the pastor, but we're smoking fall into this. I know you're trying to hide <laughs> this. How much are you spending? Oh, about 90 bucks a month. Well, that's kind of significant. Let's get that on there, too. But be real about it. Be honest. What is my spending now? Not trying to create it to look good, but create it to be reality that's in there. And then if you look at it, you're in crisis mode. The second thing I ask you to do is this. Ask yourself, how in the world did I get here? How did I get here? Sometimes it's by other people's hands. Maybe you lost a job, or maybe someone wrongs you, or something of that nature. But for many a times, it's our own habits that get us into these places to begin with, if we're honest about it. The scripture tells us that money is the root of all kinds of evil. It doesn't say all evil, just to let you know. All kinds of evil. It says that we cannot worship two masters. And a pastor loves that kind of voice because we can say, well, one master is God, and let's say the other one's money. The Bible is pretty blunt. It says you can't worship two masters. You can't worship God, and you can't worship money, capital M. You can't look and say, oh, if only money would come and save me. That makes it an idol. It makes it just like ball worship with Elijah, and God doesn't honor that. We have to look at our habits. What's God is here? Have I forgotten the voice that says that godliness and contentment brings great gain? Are there scriptures and the wisdom that's there that I'm losing? Am I spending money on stupid things? When Ryan was a kid, he's 20 today, woo-hoo, but when Ryan was a kid, we used to spend stupid money on brand, brand new clothes, brand name, because that was important to his mom. And what I got was poor, and don't tell him this, a slightly spoiled child. He's learned a lot in the last three years, but his, for when he got 18 or 19, he's like, I got my paycheck, I get to go do whatever I want. Good luck, son. <laughs> it didn't go well. He's doing really good now. But nonetheless, we're looking at those habits. What do we have to change? Let's be mindful and get in front of it. In this case scenario, we now are at the very honest standpoint of looking at it and saying, how do I fix my case scenario? And, I, and th- th- you're going to love this because it's so, so easy for me to say. <laughs> so hard to do. You have two choices when your budget's out of whack. Either cut your spending or get more income. It's not harder than that. There's no extra magic in that. It's when we start going to cash loan places and getting another credit card and trying to come up with other options that take us into a negative standpoint and put us in worse and worse shape. You have two options if you want health. It's taking and getting more income and decreasing your outflow. In this case scenario, I mean, there's obvious places that we could cut. Cable, if I'm looking at that, I'm assuming they must have HBO because that's kind of high. Either that or they got like four or five TVs on their DVR. That's a real easy place to cut, isn't it? Maybe you need to go back to a basic package. Maybe go down to one TV or get an antenna, right? And make a cut when you need to. You're in crisis mode. It's time to make some big decisions. Some other things on here, phone, 70 bucks, you probably got a data plan. Maybe you can cut there. Uh, you're spending... Might be a little high. You might be able to take your groceries up 100 and take down your spending 200. Star Wars. Let me explain Star Wars. I was trying to think, is this something fun that's really not needed? And originally I thought World of Warcraft because Sean uh, Holloway usually plays that, but he's given that up and he's not here today, so I'm not going to honor him. But uh, I thought, okay, is there other internet games that you can spend money on? And I thought of Star Wars because you're such a huge fan. Sam, Sam loves Star Wars. So in honor of you, we put in the Star Wars game. Maybe you don't need to be playing the Star Wars game. Maybe there's other things that you can do there. Again, maybe you can increase your, your income. So we're going to go to the next budget and look at some of the changes maybe that they could have made. There's some changes that they made. And I, and I do want to say this. This is moving from crisis to paycheck to paycheck. And if the crisis mode, once you start working it, should not last more than 6 to 12 months or so as a rule of thumb. And I say that for this reason. If you've been in crisis mode for two years, five years, eight years, ten years, it's time to do something different. Okay? We are not made to be in crisis mode forever. If we say, okay, today, God, I'm going to start being faithful and I'm going to take and, take and be mindful and be a good steward of this, I'm, I'm telling you, within six to 12 months, we can work together on that. From there, we've got some changes going on. I mean, house, gas, those things are pretty set, but we cut the cable. 
Uh, we even left the phone because we increased our income so we can still have some fun things. Again, we did the changes on the groceries and the spending, saved us for ourselves 100 bucks there. We're doing Star Wars because you've got to have some fun. And right now, we're kind of getting to the point that we can do that. Maybe we cut it until we got rid of those back bills. But we brought that back on. We went out and got a part-time job. And then uh, we also, again, we have our support there as well, which we see now everything evens out, but we're also being faithful to God. So we've opened up that flow between us and God for him to be able to move. And we're also being mindful of helping others. You with me? Again, very easy to do on a budget. Very hard to do in life, but if you follow the disciplines and you're a good steward and you get help, I'm telling you, you can get there. I don't say that casually. I know what it's like to have creditors calling you left and right. I know what it's like to be six months behind. I know what it's like to take and not be able to afford things. I know what it's like to not, I shouldn't be affording things, but I ignore the things I should be paying and doing the things that I can't afford to be doing anyways. I know what it's like to go through a bankruptcy after my first marriage. I know what it's like to go through a bankruptcy after our business failed. I've been there. I understand. But if you're diligent and you're using stewardship and you're using wisdom and you open up the flow between you and God, you'll get there. We're not at the point where I'm at yet. God has raised me above paycheck to paycheck. And, and, I, and that's because of him and because of hard work. And I'm thankful for it. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But my goal growing up was to be paycheck to paycheck. That was my goal. That's what my parents, my parents were always either in crisis mode, never let us know, which I still can't look back and see any hints of that. I just know it was there. Or paycheck to paycheck. And I was so much, that was my norm. I remember, honestly, my goal was I, I can't wait to get married, have kids, have a house. And in all honesty, I thought, and I, I, want, to be, I want to just be able to pay the bill. I don't need a lot of money. I don't want to be over, I don't, savings account that was foreign to me. I just want to be paycheck package, just like mom and dad. And that's not what God calls us to be either. It's a great place to be if you're in crisis, but it's a step. And with paycheck to paycheck, we start taking and getting things under control, and we start moving forward a little bit. We get a little foundation under our feet, and that's awesome. But it's not where we stop because it only takes getting sick with two weeks of unpaid time to put you back into crisis. It only takes taking and hitting some ice and rear-ending somebody else, and you got a $1,000 deductible to put you right back into crisis. You with me? It, with paycheck to paycheck is a good, good start for some of us, but it's not our ending spot. It's not our ending spot. We want to keep moving forward. We want to go into some other areas. Some of the things that I also suggest before we move on from paycheck to paycheck is whether you're in crisis or in paycheck to paycheck, for some of us, some of the challenges is we need to be humbled. Okay? Some of us need to be humbled. I know people that won't tithe because they have to afford groceries, but they will not go to government assistance and they will not go to a food pantry because I, I, you know, I, I just don't do that. We need to be able to ask for help. I know people who won't tithe because they have to get clothes for their kids who will not go into leaping. I know people who won't do couponing for their groceries because it's too much work, but they can't tithe or they can help others. Are you with me? We need to humble ourselves. We need to come up with a plan. We need to move forward, and I'll help you with that any way I can. Let's go to the next, next one as well. Next one we're going to see, because paycheck to paycheck, honestly, um, I was kind of putting some thought through to it. Two, maybe three years, as far as get, getting that under control and moving forward. Maybe a couple, couple years, of, again, if you've lived your whole life paycheck to paycheck, there's something better for you. And here's basically what happens when you start moving out of paycheck to paycheck. You start having some options. And you pay all your bills, and you look at it, okay? And in this case scenario, let's see, did we go to the next one already, Scott? Okay. Did we? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we cut Star Wars. Okay. Well, there. We start taking and working the program, and then the next thing you know, all of a sudden you have some extra money. Okay? And everything on the budget's covered. Everything's good, and you got a $20 bill in your hand. Now, for some of us, in all honesty, sitting here, this is not that big of a deal. That's me deciding I'm going to go to Applebee's instead of McDonald's for lunch. For some of us, this is a week's worth of gas, week's worth of spending. 20 bucks is a big deal. But... Here's the thing that's joyful when you start getting past paycheck to paycheck. I get to do whatever I want with this to an extent. Do you have any idea how much fun it is to have extra money instead of not enough? It's really, really cool. 
It's really, really cool. Because now I can say, and we did this, some of you guys saw this at Christmas. We took a certain amount of money, made it in the 20s, and laid down the floor as a family at Christmas, said, how are we going to help others with this? It's fun to do that. It's, it's awesome. And so we started praying over it. That's the first thing you do when you have extra money, pray over it. Just to let you know, I'm not going to give this to anybody, so don't get excited like there's going to be some kind of secret trick at the end. Okay, start praying about it. God, what would you have me do? Because now I'm a steward. I'm not a spender. I'm not a consumer. I'm a steward. What would you have me do with this, God? And it might be that he starts leading you to Dave Ramsey stuff. Okay? I've, Dave Ramsey, if you know him, he's a Christian financial guy. I like a lot of his stuff. And maybe God says, well, you know what? I want you to put that into his savings. And because what Dave Ramsey basically, the, the big bolts of it, and I've got some of his books. If you want one, I'll give you the, 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 the gift edition for free. But it might be that we start going the Dave Ramsey route a little bit. And he says, take and save up $1,000. Before you start paying extra, they save $1,000 as a safety net. So when you do hit the ice and you do hit somebody, you're covered. Okay? Or when you do have two weeks off of work, you're covered. And then you rebuild it. So maybe I want to put this into savings and start moving into that way. Or maybe I've got that savings, so I start paying off the little bills. So I start paying off the high interest bills. And I start coming to plan, and things start minimizing, which gives me more of these, which is awesome. I get to pray some more. I get to come up with some new solutions. Or maybe... I've got this 20, and I've got, I've got about $500 in the bank so far in savings. And God puts on my heart the person next door that has no gas money. And now I can see a need, and I know that they're praying for it. And God says, I want you to be the answer to that prayer. Do you know how awesome that is to be the awesome somebody's, uh, they, they answer somebody's prayer? It's awesome. To see a difference with what God entrusted you with, and you did something with it, as you followed him. You know what's wacky? Occasionally, he'll say, go do something fun with your kids. That's awesome to be able to do too, isn't it? To go from, I'm sorry, I know that's important to you, but we don't have the money for it, to, hey, I know you hadn't even thought about this, but can I just walk your world and let's go to bowling and let's go you know, get pizza or let's go do something that's completely out of the norm? It's freeing. It's awesome. That's why I said offerings are so much fun. When I start having a little bit of these, I'm going beyond that 10% that I give each week. That I just, to, to me, offering is what I bring to the storehouse, according to God. So I trust the leadership to, to use that. But on the offering, when I got extra, and I know, let's say, uh, we've been talking about the soundboard. We've been having problems with the soundboard. You guys saw that last week. Need a new soundboard? We don't really have the money for a soundboard. We're going to talk about it as leaders. I have no idea what we're going to do with it. But to know that needs there and the church can't afford it, then you can show up because God gave you that extra money and say, you know what, I'm going to provide this as a church. Just don't tell anybody. It's a great feeling. When God uses you that way, that's what freedom is all about. That's what freedom is all about. When you start having the extra and God wants it for you. I, I'm not saying he's going to pull riches out on you. I'm not a prosperity guy. Far from it. Most of the blessings I see that he promises me in the scripture have nothing to do with cash. But it does it do, have to do with his movement. And I know a lot of people who say, I'm being financially faithful and I'm trying and I don't know how to pay the groceries, but God came in this way and he took care of that need and he blew me away. Then I know of people who said, I can't afford everything and I'm not being faithful and I'm not going to do it God's way. And I'm just overwhelmed. I hear God move when we open up the... the the ways for him to move. You with me? These things are important. These are huge. Tell me you're not, some of us are not in bondage when God is trying to lead us to freedom. Financial freedom moves, uh, 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 having a stable uh, financial, financial stability to financial freedom, it's really not easy to show on a, on a uh, budget. It's more just a feeling that you have freedom that you have choices, that you can follow God as God leads you, and you're not stuck into bondage into these areas. I don't know why I really fall in it, to be honest. I'm somewhere between financial stability and financial freedom, where about a year and a half ago, uh, the bankruptcy took all the money that we had. Okay? And God has been very, very, very faithful as we've been trying to follow him. And one of the goals we have had, and this is going to say, sound insane for some of us, okay? One of the goals we've had is my goal going up is that I want to have enough money to pay the monthly bills for everything I need, and I move to a goal of I want to not have monthly bills. <laughs> I, want, I want freedom because I want to be able to help other people. I want to be able to do things at the church, and there's some things I want to do as a family. And so within that, by being diligent and by being saving, one of my goals I had is I want to be able to get cars that are dependable. They don't have to be brand new, but they have to be dependable for my family without having a car payment. And that's been a goal for a long time. And I'm a guy that in my early 20s, I would buy new cars every two years and trade in the other ones. 
if anybody has any financial wisdom at all, you know how just stupid <laughs> that plan is. That's what I was, and I was rolling over loans on top of loans to the point that when I was 31, 32, and I bought that tribute, the guy guy mobile that you guys are used to, right? When I bought that, it was a lease, and I was paying just a little, about $450 a month for that lease, for a six and a half year lease. Not a buy, a lease, because that's the position I put myself into. And it was tough. Six and a half years I paid that. At the end, God blessed us enough with our savings to be able to pay it off. For the last three years, instead of taking that extra money and being stupid with it, I've been putting it into the bank so that next time I bought a car, I would be in better shape. As most of you know, Facebook decided to get another car this week. It was really kind of leery back because I really love my tri tribute. Oh, I never remember that. It's a tri tribute instead of a tracer. But yeah, I really love my car. And um, I found that by being diligent, that the trade-in value was $600 more than what Kelly Blue Book said. The Jeep that I was buying was $2,000 less than what Kelly Blue Book said. And I was able to write a check, which stressed me out because I really like money in my savings account now. Bought it straight out, and now it's time to start rebuilding that money. Does that make sense? It really... blessed me that God had led us that far in just a year and a half. And most of you guys know what I get paid here. It's not because we get paid a lot of money. I mean, we've made our sacrifices in life, and God, but God has been very faithful and very true. He wants to do that for you. He doesn't want you in crisis. He doesn't want you in bondage. He doesn't want you overwhelmed. He doesn't want it to be in a boat when you see your kids struggling, that you don't have the resources to help them. He doesn't maybe want you to be rich, but he wants you to be free. He does not call you to bondage. He just doesn't. And he tells us in his word, if you are just faithful to me and you become good stewards and you grasp onto wisdom and you work this, that I will lead you to freedom. And some of us are right on the edge of being able to move from one to the other, but we don't want to make the hard decisions to get there. That's when emotion starts coming in and all this stuff gets really hard, doesn't it? That's when personal wants, a personal thing. For me, I love eating at restaurants. Cutting back from that really blows. <laughs> Just to be honest, I don't like it. But it's what we had to do for a period of time until God got us into freedom. And even then I had to watch it to make sure it's not about me using the resources I'm supposed to be helping somebody else with. Being free is so much better than being in bondage. And our God is a God of freedom. Does that make sense? For those that are in these areas, let me just give you First Timothy six seventeen through 19. It says, Command those who are rich, which none of us want to call ourselves rich, but quite frankly, as Joe preached on a couple months ago, we are rich, all of us, even the one that was crisis, is much richer than everyone else in the world. But for those of us who have financial freedom, financial stability, command those in this present world not to be arrogant or not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, which richly provides with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of lo the life that is truly life. Is your life truly life? Is your life truly life? It was a bondage. And are you willing to follow him to get there? You with me? Just that simple. It's just that freaking hard. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to move in this place, Lord. Again, it's easy to kind of go through statistics and to read a few verses, Father, but this is hard that we're talking about, Father. This is, this is just as hard as when we're talking about marriage. This is just as hard as we're talking about some of our relationships with our kids, Father. Finances really are a huge area that the enemy tries to rein us in with, tries to overwhelm us with, Father. Even ourselves, as Father, just in our humanness, Father. Wanting things. Being sucked into consumerism. 
It can be tough, Father. Some of us, it's things outside of our control when we feel like Job in the Bible because we lost our job or we lost our stability. But Father, you are not an ignorant God. You are not an uncaring God. You are a God that has the wisdom and the principles and the promises that we can hold on to to move from this place to say this is not the end and I'm not going to throw myself down in the middle of the desert and die, but I'm going to go to the mountain of God with his help and his provision and his promises so that I can hear the gentle whisper and I can step up and that you, you can lead us to a better place, a freeing place, Father, a place of generosity, a place of faithfulness and a place of freedom, Lord. Be with us with the hard decisions that some of us have to make, Lord. For some of us, Father, we've been in crisis mode so long to hear that it shouldn't be more than 6 to 12 months is a joke. That's not even realistic to some of us, Father. But if we follow you, it can be. I know that all the things that will come into people's heads, Father, as we talk about your truth, is the enemy's going to come in there and try to take us out like a sniper, Lord, and say, well, your job takes and cuts your hours every other week, or your job lays you off because it's seasonal. Then get another job. Make new steps. Move new forward ways of coming to a place where you are stable and you are free. And God, I just pray that you be with us in those decisions and that you give us the courage to do so and that you put those searches and you put those decisions in your hands with your mindful touch, breathing them in as incense, Father, the concerns and the cries of your children to get us through these paths to lead us to better ways and better days to the glory of your name for all the right reasons, Father, and our for our own. These are hard things we're talking about, God. And some of us are struggling. Father, for some of us who are struggling with guilt, we know that we keep making the same decisions. We know that we keep investing in the wrong things. Lord, I don't know how it makes you feel when we say we don't have money to give you what you've commanded, but we have money for a cable bill. What that says to you, Lord. It's hard, and we need you, and we love you. Make us a community that surrounds each other with prayer, that moves each other forward, Father, with encouragement, and reaches out to each other through hospitality, Father, and taking care of one another's needs. Send your provision, Father, so that we can help others with theirs as you direct. Give us the stewardship that leads us to the higher grounds that you call us to. In your heavenly precious name we pray. Amen. I did have one more verse I wanted to share with you. Excuse me. <laughs> Let me find it here for you. As we go from this place, I was going to check a video, same one we'll show you last, last week. Let me give you two scriptures to move forward from this place. 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 through 12 says this, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands, just as we told you. In other words, don't be lazy. So that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, and so that you are not to be dependent on anybody. You know, I'm not dependent on anybody. How many credit cards do you have? Philippians 4.19 My God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Do you believe the promises of God? My God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. If we could just grasp that one, it would take so much stress off your shoulders as you just work diligently and follow him. And with that, that's my thoughts for today. Again, if you guys need anything, if anybody needs help, if you want budgeting, uh, we're all on it. If you say, man, I'm just struggling with finances. Can I get one of those Dave Ramsey gift books? I'll get you a Dave Ramsey gift book. But this is an area that you can have freedom in. When for you, some of us, the enemy's been saying, no, you can't. And I'm tired of the enemy's lies. And I claim on to his promise. God is good. Thank you, guys.